everybody. Welcome back to the Nerdy Neighborhood and welcome back to your Friendly Neighborhood comic show. I'm your host, Lauren, your Friendly Neighborhood Bye, and I'm joined by our second appearance guest here, uh, Mr. Trevor Fernandez Lang. I can't say your last name, dude. I'm sorry. I, I got Trevor. Fernandez. I got that yeah. far. <laughs> You're good. Lankevich, man. Lankevich, like Sinkevich. I like that. It actually does roll off the tongue pretty well. It's weirdly rhythmic, yeah. <laughs> Well, welcome back, man. It's great to have you on. Um, last time we talked a little bit about Area 51 the Helix Project, and we're going to talk more about that today because Issue 6 uh, is out and about, which is cool. And they've got another project that's coming up on Kickstarter soon, which I am super psyched about because, yes, that shirt. You see that, guys? <laughs> that's what we're talking about. And before we start recording, I was telling Trevor how much I admire how great he is at picking artists and like everything he does. Cause you'll see that as we talk, like I'll put the images up here as long as Trevor doesn't yeah. give me laser eyes and say, don't put that up there, but I'll pull them up here. So you guys can see too, but man, like you have so much great stuff going on. You're, you're, you're putting out multiple books. They're all great quality. How the heck do you manage all of this? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's super hectic. As I was saying before we went live, um, I just came back from a stint of shows. I did three conventions inside of basically a month. Oof. Um, and, uh, I had basically just done, like I did a show in Boston, came mm -hmm. home for one day to repack, uh, give art notes get some work done i did not mm -hmm. sleep i oh, packed geez. through the night and then the next thing you know by like five in the morning i was on a plane to calgary canada to go do the calgary wow. expo mm -hmm. um i was there for about a week because that's that's a big show it's a four-day show and then oh, i wow, came yeah. back <clears throat> i came back tuesday night around like close to midnight uh mm -hmm. midnight wednesday that would be i guess um and have just been <laughs> like coming back to a slew of emails and logistical mm -hmm. things. Um, but I'm really, really happy to have a break from that and, and be able to chat with you tonight. Yeah, I'm glad too, because we had such a great time chatting last time. I think we talked for like over an hour or something, if I remember correctly. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm really excited just the fact that you're going to cons and stuff amongst like doing the writing yourself, trying to work with other creators on the books. I mean, you're going from, hey, buy my book, or hey, look how cool this is. What do you think? To, all right, buddy, great. You got the pages in? All right, thanks. Let me call the other guy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a huge adjustment. But I, I look at it this way. Um, I, I feel incredibly uncomfortable, and I think that's a good thing. I think it means that I'm crossing... I, I'm, I've taken a step up onto a level that I'm not familiar with yet. And I think anytime you do that it's made to be uncomfortable you're broaching new territory and so right now i'm sort of in this phase where i'm learning how to balance working with different artists on different projects all at once whereas mm -hmm. before i had one creative team that i was working with on one project and now mm -hmm. there's all of this so it is a lot it's it's been a huge um huge lesson that i'm still very much learning as we speak but yeah, uh, yeah you kind of hit the nail on the head there <laughs> Well, for those uh, viewers that are watching this that maybe didn't see the last video or have kind of forgotten, or maybe they just want to hear it again, tell us a little bit about Area 51, The Helix Project. Yeah, so that was my my first comic book series ever. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a six-issue sci-fi thriller about a half-extraterrestrial boy who's driven to uncover the circumstances surrounding his father's murder. It sends him spiraling into the jaw of a Cold War genetics conspiracy project and forces him to face a twisted ghost from his past that challenges everything he knows about himself and ultimately what it means to be human. Um, and yeah, super personal story gets to take advantage of my academic background in molecular biology. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm, I'm so, so proud of what we were able to do come the end of that series. You have that pitch perfectly memorized. <laughs> like you're an actor that memorizes a script and you also deliver it so well um which speaks to how you write this too like i mean i hadn't read the first five issues in a hot second before i read this but mm. the second i started reading it it gets right back into exactly what's going on it starts where it left off essentially but i didn't feel lost at all like i mm. was immediately pulled back in because it's so well written and of course the r is amazing the lettering is amazing the colors but like you you have such a way of 
jogging a reader's memory, I feel like. It worked for me, at least, of the second you just start writing. I'm like, oh my god, this is what's happening. I felt the emotional stakes immediately out of nowhere. I appreciate that. You know, I, uh, there are times, too, where I, I think about the benefit of maybe doing like a little recap uh, on the mm -hmm. inside of the front cover, but I'm really glad that the story was able to do that for you on its own. Yeah, I think... I mean, of course, I don't think it could really hurt to do that, but I think it is really cool when, you know, we can just jump right back into something and the emotional impact is still there. You know, like the last Hunger Games films are in two parts. So you watch part one one year and then two years later you get the second part and you're supposed to go back. And essentially the goal is the second you watch that second part in the theater, even though it's two years later, you feel like how you left off at the end of part mm -hmm. one. And here, like I felt exactly where I left off after issue five a while ago. Like, oh my God, like I didn't realize I still cared this much, but here I am <laughs> feeling things. Like what the heck am I supposed to do? Um, yeah. And I just had to keep reading. Like just closing the book and crying wasn't an option either because I had to know what happened. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's 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 really great to be able to talk about this last book too because it's such a, it's hard to contain for me because it's such an emotionally raw, um, final chapter, uh, and it's yeah. you know I kind of always talked about it like this combustion chamber between um, two figures who have been irrevocably changed by their experiences, and so uh, yeah, I don't know, it's it's just it's great to have that out and open into the world because I knew what was coming <laughs> forever ago. And you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a trip, right? Like I've never finished a series before. I've never finished a project. So mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's absolutely huge. So this, this issue really hit hard and all the emotional ways you're saying, and a lot of it as, as the nerd I am reminded me of like, Anakin and Obi-Wan's confrontation and like revenge of the Sith. Um, mm. in terms of like you had all this build up and then it's just the final just everything is ripped away you know there, there's nothing left but to throw it all out in the open and it gets brutal it's violent it's brutal it's there's not a happy resolution completely um it just is what it is or you know even luke and vader if you want but the first one I came mm. to mind I was like god it's like i'm watching anakin obi-wan again this is so <laughs> painful but it's, it's so well written and Thanks. I mean, it, it's it's freaking brutal. Like, that's one thing I actually was curious about is, you know, they are so violent to each other. How did you decide how the final blow was dealt? Because they are basically, you know, to a regular human, they're dealing like deadly, like fatal blows. But a lot of these blows aren't actually doing the final job. But eventually the final job is done. Yeah, it's so for me, I, I really wanted to use this idea that... um you know, violence becomes this uh, this outlet for the cruelty, you know, that has been thrust upon both of these characters. It's like, you know, it's the only way that they're able to sort of release that, um, that, that which has been done unto them, that, you know, that, that cruelty, mm. that violence, that torture, the anguish. Um, and it is, it's very primal in a way. It's very human that, like, as much as we don't want to admit it sometimes that is our first response as humans when things hurt us right emotionally mentally physically we lash out you know our, yeah. the, the easiest way for us to get that out is is sort of physical violence sometimes um and so i really wanted to boil the story down to its core about i mean like when you when you look at how the the roswell character was irrevocably changed he is the byproduct of cruelty and it's almost mm. this idea that sometimes the byproduct of cruelty is far worse than the thing that that created it you know um yeah. it, it's it's like this this snowball effect and now kent is forced to have ha kent is forced to confront that um and question whether or not whether or not he can allow his father to exist in this form based on how he remembers him and everything he learned from him, uh, so on and so forth. Yeah. And it was, he did such a great job with the, with the narration and the dialogue, especially the dialogue, um, you know, with Kent basically, you know, realizing spoiler alert, um, if I'm allowed to, but when Kent basically is like, 
Yeah, so, you know, I remember who you were before, but you're not him. And there's one line that really hit me in particular, which was, you know, I miss you, you know, talking about his father. And he says, and I'll keep missing you. And I was like, God dang it. What the world? Like, that is, my gosh, that is a literal gut punch, man. You, like, killed me with that line. Oh, I'm glad. No, I, I really, <laughs> no, this, this, it's funny. Uh, it's, it's. I mean, this moment, it just boils down to these two characters. Uh, and I really wanted to... I really wanted to... I don't know. Like, as much as it is violent and we're using the sort of physicality of the two figures uh, in order to get the point across, like, I needed there to finally be that conversation. Like, this is a conversation that in some way, shape, or form, these two characters have been waiting to have with each other for 13 years. And yeah. it's not the conversation either one of them were expecting uh, as, mm -hmm. as the outcome, right? Like they were both expecting very different experiences. Kent expected this loving embrace with his father and and um, Roswell was probably expecting Kent to harbor the same animosity that he does um, mm -hmm. for his, his, his captors. And um, that is not the case at all. But I, I, yeah. I needed that conversation to be there, and I needed this this idea that, like, neither one of their expectations were met, and this idea that yeah. like they're both holding on to the idea of one another, um, mm. in, in and that kind of gets caught in caught in the crossfires of what's actually happening. Yeah, I really love that because kind of like you were saying earlier with other elements of their conversation and their relationship it, it's incredibly human to we get stuck on ideas we get stuck on ideas potential fantasies what have you and we refuse to see what's actually in front of us um and one thing i especially love is that this conversation you took a whole issue to do and the last issue of your series which is an incredibly scary move i imagine you know what what made you go you know what this is the perfect last issue and it needs to be the conversation for the entire issue. It, it honestly, it felt like the only thing I could do, you know, mm -hmm. I, I had gotten to a point in the story. I, I always roughly knew how it was going to end. I knew that the story was going to mirror in many ways, the way the story begun had begun. Mm -hmm. Um, except roles were changed roles were reversed. Um, mm -hmm. and there were far more roles to cast at the end of the story. Right. Yeah. And so, um, uh, it just, it felt, it was like the only answer, you know, the story began to kind of tell itself and this, this is just kind of where we ended up. Uh, yeah. there's a lot that ha that's happened and, and Roswell has changed over the course of the 13 years. I mean, we don't get to see it, but we know it and we understand mm -hmm. it. You know, he, he talks about this idea that like his life was filtered through the sounds of, through the whirring of drills and the, the sound of flesh mm -hmm. tearing open and like that's the only life he knew and the only life kent knew was like this this sallow this this sallow like falsehood of a life where he couldn't where he had to live in the image of something that does not represent him at all and and, and to that same end like he resented who he was underneath that so it's like he couldn't be happy falsifying himself and he couldn't be happy being who he thought he was and so you know it, it or really it feels like it only could have ended this way i i can't think of another possible way that this story could have ended i love that answer because to me it really feels like uh i i've heard this from our creators where they're kind of like yeah i can plan a story out but once i start telling a story sometimes the story almost takes over where mm -hmm. you're like well, I had a plan, but the story went this way. And honestly, there's nowhere else I can go now. And I think it's just really cool because I think it speaks to just what storytelling is in general. And sometimes that's what's, that's some of the best storytelling is when you don't plan everything out. You just let it take you a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. The characters tell you what they need. You know, you don't give them what they want. You, you learn to give them what they need. Um, and it becomes something that is almost completely separate from from you as the creative force as the as the voice behind everything you're mm -hmm. you're letting them tell their story uh, and i think at the end of the day that's how the best stories are made yeah so i'm i'm trying to figure out how to word this question but i'm gonna do best i can how yeah. did you choose like 
their fighting styles essentially because there are so many different ways you could have demonstrated the violence through this scene um but there's a lot of you know they'll, they'll stab each other they'll do these big like uppercut punches how did you decide on like what that looked like and even like I mean, kind of what it felt like because, you know, the, the artist you have here is absolutely phenomenal. And, it, you know, when that punch, for example, comes in there, I, I can like feel that almost. I'm like, Jesus. Yeah. I mean, we we were honestly just thinking about what was going to be the most visceral, what was going to hurt us the most watching. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you're looking at two people who who love each other, viscerally love each other. And mm -hmm. it's just like how much. Can we hurt the reader in <laughs> a, a, by way of watching them look at these two characters doling out like punishment between one another? And so we looked at a lot of boxing, like this, like mm -hmm. this particular moment was us looking at, um, you know, like some some Mike Tyson, like the way he threw his uppercuts and like mm -hmm. just the, the how to articulate force and the way the body is being leveraged to kind of lean into that and then. Other times it was just by way of like what what is the cruelest thing, especially with Roswell, right? Because we're really denoting like a shift and a break in his psyche. What is the mm. cruelest thing we can make him do here to to show mm. just how broken he is, just how you know fractured this man's soul is at this point, uh, if he even has one mm. left. And it's this idea too where he thinks what he's doing is necessary because he thinks it's right. the, the violence is the only way to get through to his son, right? Like there's that mm -hmm. moment um, in the in the issue where uh, things get kind of quiet and um, Roswell kind of begins to, to kind of tell Kent, like, this is why I do what I do, you know? And mm -hmm. it's hard, like, you know it's wrong, but it's, it's hard to blame him for it, you know? And, right. and so at the end of the day, it's almost like, <clears throat> not that we're trying to justify the the brutality of roswell but it's almost like man like of course this is what this guy would do like the, of course this is mm -hmm. the only way he knows how to get his point across because he's been he's been subdued and withheld for 13 years like mm -hmm. he he can almost only communicate in the most extreme ways possible there's yeah. no temperance anymore yeah i think that's a good word you use too an interesting word temperance um i think they're both fighting for that in a way um, but I mean, neither one of them's completely right. I mean, Kent's definitely more, you know, morally mm -hmm. <laughs> justified and, and makes more sense. And, but, you know, even in the end, so like that last, that last page and even that final panel and then yeah. that the end, it was such a sudden ending, but it also didn't feel wrong. Cause a lot of times, you know, sudden endings can kind of be like, feel like a disservice as a reader or a viewer, whatever it is. But this didn't feel like a disservice. It felt like it made complete sense to mm -hmm. to end it that suddenly. What what kind of drove drove you to be like, okay, that's it. That that is exactly where it needs to stop. That's it. It's funny. I almost cut to black. Uh, oh really? I did like a Sopranos cut to black. Yeah, I was very mm -hmm. very close to doing that. And then, um, so if if readers pull in those last couple of pages, so from the double page spread uh, mm -hmm. into the final page actually really play around with i think pages 14 they're mirrors of pages 14 and 15 of issue one like ah. the, the, the body language the, the composition um the mm -hmm. design of the page replicates that double page spread in issue one mm -hmm. where roswell is approaching the the officer and the officer fires on roswell but mm. we're we're sort of very deliberately again recasting those roles um, mm -hmm. So instead of Roswell with the gentle approach, he's he's monstrous, he's ravenous, he's animalistic, and now Kent mm -hmm. is on the other side of the gun. And then you have sort of a sequence of, um, if I remember correctly, the 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 person behind the gun, and it's been a while since I've seen that page. Um, <laughs> it's like the person behind the gun, the people, the things that are left to bear witness to the tragedy, which. There's no one there. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we kind of really play into that that motif that we've used throughout the course of the series of the, this hollow thunder that echoes throughout their life. You know, there's just that the, the thunder on overhead. Like that's the only thing left to bear witness to the tragedy of, of this moment. And almost yeah. like 
this this twisted mirror of history repeating itself in a way um mm. and then you know you have the monster which is roswell where before it was the cop you know who was um who refused to understand that was roswell who refuses to understand the situation mm. um and then you have instead of you know um uh instead of like a what's what i'm looking for um so that on that last one of the last panels you, you see on that original page is is kent kind of as a, as a child like in awe of what's just happened and he's leaning over his father and there's the reflection of the moon in roswell's eyes it's like mm -hmm. what if we extrapolate that on that last page and that the last thing you see is is roswell lifeless and the reflection of kent's outline in the lightning uh mm -hmm. as this metaphor that he's he's taken control of of that empty thunder you know what i mean it's no longer this thing that echoes involuntarily throughout throughout his life he's like I, i'm gonna wield that you know i'm not gonna let yeah. it control me anymore um and and it, it is mine like he's taking control of his identity now he knows who he is and he knows that in order to live in the service of of his identity and to live in the service of truly to live in the service of the memory of his father he can't let this monster walking around in his skin exist mm -hmm. um and so i don't know it just it felt in and of itself like it, it felt like this last image it, it felt like it echoes really well you know like it is this image is almost like the visual representation of that that empty thunder that echo is like i don't know i feel like it just sticks with you uh in, yeah in way. and and this story never was never going to have a clean friendly resolution like that that couldn't yeah. happen i could not give that to kent but there is a lot of power it's it's tragic it's incredibly tragic but it is a lot of power um that kent has sort of learned to garner over the course of the series and he's and he's accumulated that uh through experiencing loss but he's he's taken that that pain and he's used it to like fortify himself um and i don't know like it <clears throat> i mean it's just such a, a i mean just like uh superficially it's also just like such a badass final image you know um it is it's i was just looking at it as you're talking and honestly those last few pages are and, and i don't say this lightly but they're some of the best comic pages i've seen in terms of the art looks amazing the con the concept the layouts are great the panels and the emotional impact is is skyrocketed uh, i mean it's it's just such great composition to that last page and you see the reflection in the eye and you got the blood and i mean you can even still see like kind of the the lines of his eyes you can still kind of see that sadness at the same mm -hmm. time like there's there's so much that was done on that page so like full kudos to you and the entire team because that is that's not something that is done easily at all <laughs> yeah i man th th this was one of those moments where i desperately wished we we had had traditional pages for the series because mm. i would have outbid every person on the pl face of the planet earth to have the original of that last page it's it's mm. literally it's my lock screen on my phone like yeah i i love that last page i think it's it's easily the greatest like uh, the the throughout the course of the series i think i kind of we we built the reputation of having crazy last pages and that mm -hmm. like by far takes the cake i mean it's just like yeah. it's i don't know it just it represents a lot to me yeah. to the characters to the story and it just looks beautiful i mean it does um, it could it would it could be a poster it could be a movie poster specifically i mean like it's it's absolutely wild. So these guys watching this at home later and you're like, can you put it on screen? No, you have to go buy it. You have to go buy it and it will be worth your money. I promise you, you will yeah, not think, be disappointed. I think I was thinking like once we get to trade, maybe I'll make like a, a foil print of that last oh, page. That would be so good, man. Yeah, I think that would be really, really, really cool. Selfishly, like I might just make one for myself, anyways. <laughs> but yeah, those guys like Sam, um, who is the artist, and uh, Marcio, who is our colorist, like just absolutely blew it away. I mean, we we workshopped it a little bit, but like these guys really did put in that time and effort, and they had to put up with me being an absolute douche about that <laughs> whole thing. 
Um, but I, I really do think that like we created a, a last page that just sits with people. It certainly sits with me, and I've known about that page now for eight or nine months. You know, right? Yeah, it's it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, so, how can people get their their copies of of this and the rest of the series if they they still want them? Yeah. So if you guys, um, if you guys like follow me on any social media, there will always be a link tree in my bio in which you can find the link to our shop. Um, but you can also go to darknightnation.com slash shop. Um, if you are then interested in checking out my next work minutes to midnight, the hour between life and death, we will actually have several uh, options available to you both physically and digitally to grab area 51, the helix project in the process checking out my next work which i would recommend it'd be a big help to us um because it certainly uh helps bolster the 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 success of the campaign um and you still get everything all in one you don't have to stop at the helix project and you can keep the train on rolling and do something that i think uh, is arguably even better uh, than what we did with the helix project yes so tell us a little bit about that, this, this Men's Midnight, because it is available to sign up for the pre-launch, which is fantastic. So what can we expect from this one? It's, uh, it's you know, creatively, it was me looking at the comic book industry and saying, I know you go you're going to want to pigeonhole me after I do the Helix Project. I know that mm. for a fact. You're going to want to make me the sci-fi guy uh, mm. or the alien guy or whatever. And I'm like... I will be whatever kind of guy I want to be. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I mean, there, there is the obvious choice of wanting to work with the, the Helix Project team again because they are so spectacular and so good and they already know how to put up with me and my BS. Um, but it was also a really cool opportunity to, to widen my network, learn new ways of working, you know, uh, and creating with uh, different artists from all around the world. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I came up with this idea that I wanted to do collections of short stories every year um, that reflect uh, a theme that I think corresponds to a time of day uh, or a time mm -hmm. on the pocket watch, right? Like the name of my publishing uh, company, yeah. whatever you want to call it, is Pocket Watch Press. And so I thought, what better time to start at than midnight? You know, it's, it's our first anthology. It is the beginning of a new day, the end of the old day. Um, mm -hmm. to me, it represents this idea of perspective, uh, because, you know, when you're, when you're sitting there in the, the sort of quiet of the evening, you can either choose to, to, to indulge yourself and make horrible decisions because you're, you're wrapped up in something that is controlling you from the day prior or the week prior or the month prior, however, or you can choose to to shift your perspective, and so right. um, what what I ended up coming up with were a, a handful of short stories of varying genres that all deal with this idea of perception um, and and perspective, and you know. So we have um, some familiar faces joining us from the Helix Project. Uh, Samuel Ibunze is actually penciling, inking, and coloring uh, what I think is going to be the highlight story. Uh, in nice. the collection called Reflections and Other Little Devils. Um, mm -hmm. This is Reflections is easily the most ambitious thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. We are really pushing what we think ourselves capable of in terms of page design, flow of the storytelling, um, mm -hmm. and 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 just going absolutely wild. It's moody. It's atmospheric. It's emotional. It's cerebral. I really do think it represents everything and then some um, that I was mm -hmm. able to learn on the Helix Project. And same with Sam. I mean, he, you know, we always kind of have this constant discussion of intentionality and how to represent that. And this story mm -hmm. is all sort of psychosis and emotion. Um, mm -hmm. And he, he absolutely knocked it out of the park. Um, and then uh, moving further, we have The Marvelous Misadventures of the Melancholy Man which is mm -hmm. a supernatural coming of age story with the incredibly talented Steph C um, who uses uh, colored pencils layered with watercolor. It's stunning. It's, it reminds me of uh, Pixar animation. Um, you have the bear market businessman there, which, which was that first page you were poking at, which is a mm -hmm. sort of futuristic, um, really, really like emotional interpersonal story that takes place like 150 years into the future. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and that's actually uh, uh, that's those pages are done by in, the incredible Ryan Best, uh, who's mm-hmm. who's a, a friend that I met last year at Heroes Con in Charlotte, and was able to uh, bribe him when we reconvened in New York a couple <laughs> months later. Uh, and mm-hmm. then we, I've got a cool announcement coming for the last story in the project, which is uh, Time Fleeting War Immortal. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I sorry. I feel like I'm going on aimlessly. I, I might have a better go at this if you had questions that I could then answer. That's what's here for. That's okay, man. Like I that that's what that's when I know I'm doing my job well is when you guys start rambling and I can sit here and just be in awe and every once in a while throw out compliments that I want to throw out and ask a question or two. Like that's how I know something good is going on, but. I wanted to throw these up here, these preview pages, because, I mean, you have different artists here. You've got diverse, different styles, different themes, but they all are, like, top quality, which Mm. I know, I know a lot of people don't like to talk about this, but let's be real, you know, anthologies or stories with multiple themes, things like that, people kind of get drawn away from because of the vast variety of art styles or different storytellings or themes or whatnot, and people don't always like each one but this one every single one of these preview pages i enjoy the heck out of that's good i'm glad to hear that (laughs) Um, i really like i said i really wanted to stretch myself creatively play in different sandboxes uh challenge myself to learn uh new approaches because every artist Mm -hmm. that i work with has a slightly different approach to the to the process and they're all incredible they're all insanely talented and There's so much that I've gotten to learn from each one of them uh, about the craft, you know, about how to visually direct a story in comics, about how to use the page, about how to use texture. Um, And 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 I think those those things are put on in full display in these stories. Um, Yeah, they're 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 also vastly different. They have different voices, different styles, um, but they all do sort of play to that theme of perspective. Uh, or, or a lack thereof, um, mm. which can prove to challenge these characters. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm a huge fan of stories like that, um, of stories that challenge characters, they challenge perspectives, they challenge how I think as a reader, um, because it, it's hard to find stories that do that, and they do it well, um, and, and it's executed well. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, these guys, these guys killed it. I mean, I... I set out for a big task and I've admittedly been sort of scatterbrained, just adjusting to um, splitting myself in so many different directions. And uh, I mean, these guys have been incredible. I mean, <laughs> to I, I'm so proud that, you know, the first project that I get to do after my first series uh, just has this mm-hmm. level of variety and this level of style and um, this level of effort, you know, like, I'm not resting on my laurels and neither of these guys, right? Like you, Mm -hmm. you come in sometimes to, to doing short stories and artists uh, might sometimes phone it in because it's a non-committal gig. And, and Mm -hmm. every single artist I had the privilege of working with brought their a game every step of the way. Uh, And I'm, I'm so grateful because I think we, we, each of us have created something uh, as a collective that is far greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah, absolutely. It's like putting all the pieces of pocket watch together. So there you go. Yeah. It just you can you can tie so many things back to your company may, name, man. You chose very well with that. <laughs> I tried. I did my best. <laughs> <laughs> so since this is a Kickstarter, um, you know, without sharing what you aren't able to share yet, but are there any rewards that we should be on the lookout for that people can be super excited about? Absolutely. So. Um... I mean, it, it's it's pretty cost effective. It's it's pretty decent sized book. It's sixty four pages. Um, mm-hmm. We are planning to launch with three variant covers. Um, on launch, I will actually have early bird tiers that are discounted nice. for my day ones for the people that have been incredibly supportive of me. You know, I've mm-hmm. I've been um, I've been told relentlessly that I I do not charge enough for my books, and while <laughs> there isn't. Um, there isn't a significant price hike. I was like, you know what? I want to reward the people that have been with me from the beginning that have supported me before they, they knew um, or, or before they knew what I might've been capable of. So those mm-hmm. people, you know, 
from the beginning are going to get the comics basically at the same equivalent price of what they would have gotten before. Mm -hmm. And then afterward, uh, all the prices go up by like three or four bucks or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. We will have a very limited amount of producer and executive producer tier uh, rewards available, which like the Helix Project gives you an official credit. Um, you have the option within that space to potentially get some commissioned art from one of the artists um, mm. on the project. Uh, you get cool exclusive products like, you know, the shirts, the merchandise. <laughs> um, and, and there may or may not be one tier to get drawn into this and my uh, next project after Minutes to Midnight. Ooh. So that's super super exciting uh but those will only be available for like the first two weeks because i'm hoping to go to print like asap uh, yeah. i really want to have this book ready for my sort of summer conventions uh, and mm. i want to fulfill as soon as i possibly can so mm -hmm. yeah uh those will be available we will have uh, art prints um we will have potentially the ability to unlock a new variant cover uh we've mm -hmm. we've gotten inundated with people wanting us to do like um <coughs> uh continuous covers so having mm -hmm. like three books kind of all yeah con connecting covers one, mm -hmm. one large image which we we might be willing to do if if the support is there from the ground floor um mm -hmm. you know a, a bunch of stuff uh and a lot of sort of crowd pleasing tiers from previous campaigns that we noticed people would like um digitals are going to be super cost effective you can bundle copies of this book with the helix project if you haven't gotten on so far at a discounted mm -hmm. rate um like i think i think uh you can get the entirety of the helix project and all of this for it's like it's like 18 dollars for digital oh so wow and yeah, that's a steal it's under 20 bucks yeah it's like it's like 200 and be like 220 230 something pages yeah that's a steal you can't beat that i mean we give you a 20 you give us two bucks back how does that happen <laughs> yeah yeah no it's it's pretty pretty cost effective um and we're still you know we we still as of recording this we still have a little bit of time so i'm still sort of workshopping some fun ideas for mm -hmm. uh rewards um but you know I, I think we'll have some really really fun surprise elements for you guys uh we might even have a piece of original art available for the Ooh. discerning art collector so a lot mm -hmm. to look forward to for sure that's awesome i love how you just gave us the whole rundown so you guys heard it here first that's everything and you know you never know when this guy's gonna surprise you because this guy always has a gazillion tricks like he doesn't need a hat to put them under they just come out of nowhere <laughs> yeah they come out of my ears you know i would believe it honestly with <laughs> with, with how your your books have gone so far i would believe it <laughs> <laughs> no it's 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 really exciting and it's different uh i i hope people get in on the ground floor of this because it's it is anxiety inducing right it's my first thing outside of a series right um, it's experimental but i think that there is like people say this all the time uh, as a marketing move but i think it's true there is something for everybody in this collection mm -hmm. like if you want something that's a little bit more graphic a little bit more eerie you have it you you want something yeah. that's a little bit more innocent a little bit more playful but still filled with a, a sort of life lessons you got it like you want something mm -hmm. that's deeply personal and emotional and volatile you got it like there's there's and 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 that also speaks to the stylistic variety that you brought up too. You know, the artists that mm. are, are working on each of these stories are distinctly different, and uh, each of them at the top of their game. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Just from those preview pages alone, that's all I need to be sold on it. Honestly, um, I'm super excited for it too, man. Like, I I really love the Helix Project. You did such a phenomenal job on that. I have full faith that this is going to get backed i have full faith this is gonna be absolutely amazing i know that does not help your anxiety but i'm gonna try anyway <laughs> i appreciate it i'll take what i can get at this point right <laughs> and those of you guys watching at home be sure to hit that pre-launch page i'll put it in the link below so you can just click like two or three times and you're pre-saving a great book so you're gonna forget about this like we all do and that's okay but your email will remind you as it should so true all set <laughs> true yeah yeah it's um listen uh, like i said i i think that 
pretty much anybody will find something to like about it whether it's me whether it's what i have to contribute or the 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 artists uh, i mean there's just like an insane amount of variety um we're also including some extra sort of behind the scenes features in the back of the book sort of talking Ooh. about the processes um mm. of working with each artist and um sort of explaining maybe the differences of how those stories came to be i think it's really cool uh for anybody that's just interested in process but particularly for the aspiring creator out there um mm -hmm. and and yeah i i think it's frankly i i think you know there are there are things in there i mean i'll, I'll say straight out it's the best thing i've ever done you know i think start to finish um the story that i have with sam is is just out of this world i think we it, it, it puts our maturity as storytellers on full display i think that story time fleeting war mortal uh which mm. we haven't gotten to uh, announce the artist for yet but um mm. that it's probably one of the most conflicting and complex stories like it mm. it's it and it, it would the the crazy thing about that story is it started out as like this historical fantasy like satire Mm -hmm. um, and it is satirical in a way, but it becomes more like a um, like a Dante esque comedy. So like, Ooh, you know, it's, wow, it's, that's a shift. I like it. Though. Yeah, yeah. There, there is a huge element of like tragedy woven deep in, inside of that. Um, and mm -hmm. and I think it, it evolved into something really special. Like when I was when I was first writing that story, I was like, oh, okay, like this is pretty good. This is something to get myself cooking. It's different. And I got um six pages in it was originally only going to be six pages and uh, mm. i was like no i'm i'm not really satisfied here it's funny but it's not it's not punchy enough uh mm -hmm. and that story just like grew and evolved and changed and now it's 18 pages wow um, yeah i mean same with reflections you know reflections and other little devils was originally uh like 12 or 13 pages and now it's 22. Mm. um wow. so you know I, the, I think the cool thing is is I let those stories be as long or as short as they need it to be. And I, yeah. and I let those stories inform their lengths and inform what happened inside of them. And and in that way, I think it really does like, I, I think it, it just displays the, the creative maturity that's that I've undergone over the last two years. You know, I let the mm -hmm. stories tell themselves. And like, I mean, there were at one point when I thought those other stories were going to be shorter, there were two other short stories in this collection. And yeah. I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm not going to constrict these 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 characters' times and their journeys and their arcs um, because of some arbitrary number that I put on them. I think people would rather have four amazing stories than six stories that were good but not great. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I I felt really free having the opportunity to do that and to let these stories be what they need to be. Yeah, and I love that. I love how authentic that you are. You have been so far with your stories, and it sounds like you're going to continue to be with Mints of Midnight. Um, because you know, I am. You know, I do understand how sometimes like having some limitations can actually help creativity in ways mm -hmm. that we don't realize until we do. And like, huh, that actually helped. But I really love what you're saying, and it makes a ton of sense as well. That. On the other hand, it also helps sometimes to be able to take those shackles off and say, hey, this isn't working right now, but I can do this instead. And so, I mean, in a way, you still are setting boundaries. You're not having six stories anymore. You've cut the number of stories, but you're telling the story you feel is more authentic, that you think readers will enjoy better, that you feel more proud of. And I think that's the right call, man, in that situation. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I think those two particular stories that I had mentioned that, that ended up growing by quite a bit, they were fine stories. And now they are things that I I'm, I'm proud to have and show off in my portfolio any day of the week. You know, mm. I mean so much so that like one of the things like reflections in particular, uh, I'm not going to lie. I've, I've thought about like, like that story has legs like that, that mm. story there's, I think there's more to that story than what I had just included in the collection and that was never my intention but you mm -hmm. know those characters kind of tell me what they need and, and what what more i can do with them and it was just a really cool free creative process for me um yeah. and i think having that experience will also benefit me in those situations where my environment might be a little bit more structured um mm -hmm. so it's it, it was really exciting and i'm really proud of what we did and 
I think people are going to really, really love being able to sink their teeth into a nice 64 page book. Yeah. Oh, I know it, man. They, they're becoming more and more sought out. I feel like more fans are wanting to be able to read like complete stories all at once rather than having buying single issues left and right. So I'm really excited. I think this is going to be so freaking great. Um, again, those guys watching, be sure to hit that pre-save page link below. If you don't, I will be very sad yeah, and too. nobody wants that. So <laughs> nobody wants Trevor and Lauren to be sad. So yeah, we, we gave you guys, we gave you guys the first look on the internet at those pages. So you guys know you're, you're contractually look. bound. Contra you're contractually brown when you join the neighborhood that thing you sign and get in that you don't read it's in that <laughs> it's in there <laughs> well trevor thank you so much for coming on tonight please plug yourself away add in anything else you need to about these great projects you have uh, lauren it was, it was so great to be here uh, i'm so grateful for the opportunity to talk about uh these things that spilled out of my head <laughs> um, but if if people want to follow me and follow where those spilled things uh travel to uh, you can check me out on Twitter at P watch press. It's shortened for pocket watch press, um, on Instagram at pocket watch press. Uh, we have a Facebook page for pocket watch press as well. You're going to want to stay up to date on all of those things. And while you're there, poke around, sign up for my newsletter. Uh, we release those typically once every two weeks. Occasionally I will, uh, increase to weekly, depending on how much is going on, what news needs to be shared. Um, so with everything going on with con season, with the new project coming out, uh, announcements, so on and so forth. Uh, I, I'll probably be alternating sort of two weeks to a week, but uh, you, you get a lot of really great material out of that, whether it's just news and updates or behind the scenes looks at the process, the creative elements of, of developing books, even some of the things that people, I mean, I don't think people really talk about that all that often, but there are also sort of production elements. Like um, on my last newsletter, I sort of talked about the process of having a book spot lost and mm -hmm. how like you you are supposed to prepare that uh, that art for the spot gloss so that the printer knows how to do that, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we do giveaways too. So we'll uh, we'll actually we're actually going to be coming up on our, our summer giveaway as well. So that's super exciting. But make sure you drop me a follow. Uh, of course, like subscribe to the the YouTube channel down below. If you're not, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> um, but it's seriously it is it is a privilege to be here it is so great to talk about um to talk about really anything with you lauren but i uh, i'm grateful that you enjoyed the material and i hope that i can continue to deliver oh i have no doubt about that man and again nobody's perfect so try not try not to beat yourself up too much <laughs> try not to put too because i guarantee you if you're anything like me I set high expectations for myself than virtually anybody else does. And I always realize it too late. I'm like, well, I just beat myself up for no reason. That's great. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> You'll do great, man. You got cons coming up. You're going to be able to see more people in person to tell you how great your stuff is. So oh, yeah, yeah. I know if, you're excited for that. Yeah, if anybody's watching, I'll be at Heroes Con in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina in June. I'll have to come find you because I'll be there. So I'll yeah, come find you. absolutely. <laughs> come say hi. Yeah, it's such a fun show. Um, so Heroes Con, uh, Terrific Con in July, which is a, a Connecticut-based show. Mm -hmm. um, and then in August, hopefully, Fan Expo Canada. Um, mm -hmm. And in September, I have uh, Baltimore Comic Con and Oof. Memphis Comic Expo. And then October... Uh, I will be in New York and then November I will actually be across the pond um, in the UK for the Thought Bubble Comic Festival, which I am mm -hmm. incredibly excited for. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you guys want to come track my ugly mug down, let me like talk your ear <laughs> off about comics, maybe scribble my name and vandalize your books. Those yes. are some of the places where you can find me. That should be a t-shirt. Vandalize my comics. I like that. <laughs> I've never heard it said that way. That's so fun. Well, thank you, Trevor. I am super excited to hopefully meet you in person in Charlotte this year. That's going to be a blast. Um, we might just have an impromptu neighborhood meetup. So if you guys are going to be in Charlotte, let him know. Let us know. Like, we'll come find you. We'll, we'll, sure. we'll track the whole neighborhood down and see what chaos we can create and have Charlotte ban us from visiting ever again. So... <laughs> It'll be totally fine. <laughs> Sounds like a good time. I'm all here for it. Let's do it. <laughs> well, thanks again for watching y'all at home. Uh, be sure to check out all the links below. I'll link all the links Trevor said uh, for Pocket Watch Press as well. So you can just click a couple times and have some fun. Um, 
Be sure to like, share, and subscribe this video. I know that is super cheesy, but all that cheesy stuff really helps us grow. And be sure to follow Pocket Watch Press as well so they can keep growing. And we'll see you guys next time in the Nerdy Neighborhood.